the government is a good paymaster. They pay three months in advance. Wait, they pay three months in advance? They pay three months in advance, huh. which is the reason why I have a, always have this certain level of cash in my balance sheet at a reporting dates, right? It's because the money comes in advance. One of the things that, of course, we can do better is to manage this cash. La. Actually, the, the smartest thing to do is to take that cash and reduce your debt and then uh, draw it back up again mm. when you need to pay dividends. So that's the, to reduce the negative carry. We are going through a round of refinancing right now. So that will be one structure that we're putting into the, the, our debt. Welcome back to the Financial Coconut Podcast. It's a special series called Be Retired. We're working with Ritas and SGX. I'm your host, Reggie, aka your Chief Financial Coconut. And I'm joined with the co-host, Kenny. You want to introduce yourself for yeah. audience that don't know you? Yeah, I'm Kenny Law, risk specialist and also independent financial advisor. I run a, a website, read website uh, focused on Singapore, read, readsavvy.com, R-E-I-T-S-A-V-V-Y.com. Is that the only one in Singapore? Stock screener for REITs? There are quite a few, but I want to make it most comprehensive. And so that whoever really want to invest in Singapore REIT, that will be the screener they need to go to. Okay, great. And today we have an interesting guest in studio. Uh, Josh, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Josh. I'm the e uh, CEO of uh, Elite UK REIT. I've been here in this job for about one year, but I've been in the real estate REIT uh, financial uh, sector for more than for close to 20 years. UK re right yes. elite UK re That's why, right. why 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 yeah. UK do you study in the UK actually I didn't <laughs> uh, I studied uh, in Singapore and Japan but actually never in the UK <laughs> how do you end up in this, this? is uh, there no personal affinity to, to the place because well, all your properties are in the UK right? yes so, yeah, exactly yeah. exactly well I mean it's a, it's a it's a very interesting market I think what, not many of us probably sort of aware of it personally but then you know we're actually quite comfortable with what the UK stands for uh, mm. rule of law uh, property rights and these are uh, this is some of the reasons why i think many of us in this region will invest in real estate in the uk we send our children to the uk they don't really have guns there and uh, and uh you know it's it's a much safer environment uh it has a you know a very strong uh, education sector mm. it's also the sixth largest economy in the world yeah so yeah. you know i think uh the uk actually is something that we are all quite familiar with uh like a lot in this region they yeah. actually are a very big supporter of elite uk read mm. uh we talk to them uh, a lot uh, nice. We're quite close with the High Commission here, as well as the Department of Business and Trade. Yeah, okay. So for, for our audience that mm. isn't familiar with the REIT itself, mm. right? So what are y'all doing? What is your composite? What's your what's your story? You know, uh, we listed in 2020 with the first and only uh, GBP REIT. We listed in, in sterling pounds. The only one on the on the SGX actually. Uh, oh. REIT and non-REIT. We listed uh, with a predominantly uh, UK government type of uh, credit risk profile. And it is as uh, sovereign as you could get. It's signed, the leases are actually signed with the Department of State for uh, leveling up and communities. So this is uh, as good as you could get to a sovereign risk, but not with the local councils. And uh, our key occupier in our property is actually the Department of Work and Pension. They use these uh, assets as job centres. So job centers is also something that, you know, I constantly need to educate, you know, people in this part of the world, what, what it stands for, what it means. In the UK, they have a long history, more than 100 years of uh, social welfare. So in the UK, if you have uh, lost your job and you need some uh, help uh, in terms of getting a new job, and also some temporary financial assistance, uh, you walk in a job center. Mm. As such, the Department of Work and Pensions have actually a white paper that stipulates that all the job centers need to be on average within 20 minutes of public transportation. Okay. We're talking about bus and, and train travel mm. to a job center to serve the wider community. So they're all together, uh, the DWP is in close to 600 properties all around the UK. Yeah. We own 136 of these properties with the largest landlord. Yeah, yeah interesting. And, and I mean, for our listeners that, you know, you've not been to London or you've not been to the UK. Mm. Um, you 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 may need a little bit of time to understand this thing. But yeah. I've been there for a while, and I and I looked at you know your property suite, right? It's all the red bricks, lah. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I mean, small I mean, little red bricks and the different town centers and and all that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. exactly right. And if if I could uh, use one word to or two words to to explain what a job center is, I think for for a listener in this part of the world in Singapore, it will be like a community center. Mm. It really serves the community needs. You could call them offices but you could, they're actually more social infrastructure more government infrastructure mm -hmm. in that nature so 
you know, you, like you wouldn't have your community center being based out of MPFC. Uh, <laughs> you, these are assets that yeah. are functional. They're not sexy, you know, gleaming uh, mm. skyscrapers, but, you know, they are very, very much locational and dispersed across yeah. the UK. Yeah. yeah, actually the building is very, very different from Singapore. It Although is. we started off as a elite commercial read, mm. the commercial office, but for the listener, those commercial office is not the same as the Singapore. Correct. <laughs> so, so recently, after you join for one year, then you have made a, such a uh, so-called uh, changes, mm. you, are invest, uh, you are expanding your investment mandate Correct. to other asset class and change the elite commercial rate to elite UK rate. Yeah. Actually, what trigger uh, mm. these changes? Maybe I start with, with the easier question <laughs> first, the, the name change. So when I joined here about a year ago, actually I thought elite commercial rate, the commercial bit is actually there's nothing quite yeah. commercial about uh, the, the assets in, in the sense that <laughs> social. That's yeah. how you sold to the board. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean... It's like, hey, bros, you know, not very commercial. No, no, I mean, yeah, because in fact, actually, you think about it, uh, if, if you want to call it in another way, it'll be more social read, right? Uh -huh. Because in the sense that uh, they actually serve a purpose, you know, helping alleviate poverty, helping uh, to improve uh, in employment prospects and economic prospects for the most deprived part of the UK. So they actually have a very big sustainability agenda in terms of the S of ESG, which is a social. So many so many other uh, companies that's listed on the SGX will have a focus on the E of ESG. If I could uh, change anything in this upcoming year, we definitely want to you know advertise a bit more on our, our S of ESG. So dropping the, the commercial bit out of the name was was, you know, I think to me quite necessary. Yeah, yeah. Then the other bit as well is we are listed in pounds. Our debt is in pounds. Uh, our dividends are in pounds sterling. So that's quite a unique structure that we have. And we also actually, for, for tax purposes, consider as a UK REIT. Uh, meaning to say, in terms of structure, we're very uh, efficient. Some of our REIT peers have also asked us, how do you do it? We actually have a listing in, in the Channel Islands. So it's a complying listing, but it's not traded. It's fully owned by the REIT in Singapore. But it's a collective investment schemes, which we look through our, right? And uh, as, as a listed REIT in the UK, we enjoy the same level of tax as any other UK listed uh, REIT on the LSE, for example. Mm -hmm. So that, man, think is, is also quite I think, uh, relevant for us. The other bit is also, you know, with this change strategy, the UK part of it or in the name will also denote the boundaries of where our focus, where our strategy is going to be. We're not going to be going to, you know, France or Poland or the US. We're just going to be really confined to the UK. And that's the, the name change actually will reflect that sort of a focus and, and strategy as mm, well. Mm. Now, coming to the sort of a expansion of investment strategy, we have been doing this for some time with some of our vacant assets. I think uh, we have been looking to relet them where we can. But in some, some of these uh, spaces, given the nature of the assets and how they are located within uh, key transportation nodes and amenities, it makes a lot of sense for them to have a higher and better use. In some cases, built to rent residential or PBSA, purpose-built student accommodation. These are a couple of sectors in the what we call the living sector, quite interesting right now and uh, is having some uh, tailwinds which we can tap on. Mm. So we've been looking at some of these potential opportunities, but it has been to the point where, you know, we get we get a planning uh, change. What do we do with the assets? Do we sell them or do we continue to hold them? So up to the change of, of mandate of the expansion of investment strategy, all we could have done was just to sell it if it's not commercial or if it's not office, right? Which actually limits our upside uh, by quite a fair bit. And we want to prosper and we want to benefit our unit holders as well. So by having this slight change in our investment strategy, we do have a lot more options as well. Okay. And it also helps us when we negotiate on our upcoming lease expiry. So I just want to be clear, right? Mm. So essentially, the REIT involves a whole bunch of, you know, uh, red brick bu uh, buildings. They're yep. not so commercial, very yes, social, yes. social, 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 you know, in, in itself. Yep. And your investment strategy is to continue to to lease it to the UK government. Yes. And then whatever that you think has an upside or whatever that is kind of like not working as well, you want to so-called upgrade it. Yes. And one of your bigger strategies is to this, do this whole student accommodation yes. uh, thing, right? Yep. So, so that's the baseline of your invest, investment thesis. Yes, correct. The investment years. thesis, uh, since our IPO, I think many of the investors that invested it is because, you know, they like the government nature of the cash flows. Mm. And uh, that that's really a big comfort uh, coming from where I came from. 
previously. So I mean, um, just <laughs> saying. Elaborate a bit more. <laughs> no, how, how 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 why why you find comfort in that? Just been through a very uh tumultuous period during pandemic, where I guess you know read uh, landlords are uh, or any real estate landlords are recording revenue every every month, every quarter, every year, but then three months down the road, six months down the road, find that they are not able to collect it, then they have to do a write-off, right? But uh, for us, we know that they pay, they, the, the government is a good paymaster. They pay three months in advance. Wait, they pay three months in advance? They pay three months in advance, huh. which is the reason why I have a, always have this certain level of cash uh, uh-huh. in, my, in my balance sheet at uh, reporting dates, right? It's because the money comes in advance, right? And one of the things that, of course, we can do better is to manage this cash law. Yeah, and, three month uh, advance rental has correct. a lot of float. You can do a lot of things. Correct. Yeah. The, actually, the the smartest thing to do is to take that cash and reduce your debt, and then uh, draw it back up again mm. when mm. you need pay dividends. So that's the to reduce the negative carry. Mm. So mm. we are going through a round of refinancing right now. Uh, so that will be one structure that we're we'll putting into the into the, the our debt, which will give us that flexibility. Interesting. Okay, mm. but uh, do you run a risk single tenant risk, right? Because mm. the government is big, right? They, Correct. Although you are the landlord, but they're the government, right? So yes. <laughs> no. So, so, so that's a very uh, relevant question because uh, I mean it's a double edged sword. As with with anyone yeah. that deals with the government, they can be a good paymaster, but at the end of the day, they also you know something of value, right? For us, you know, when we talk to them about leases, uh, we talk about you know and all that. That we would, I think, in my opinion, have a fairly strong position at the negotiating table. Why? So the DWP, for example, our largest landlord, they are in 600 properties. We are the largest landlord. So when you negotiate, fortunately, I don't need to speak to 136 people. I speak to a small team. We do sort of uh, look at things at a portfolio level so that there is a bit of, you know, give and take over there as well. And, uh, you know, I think as well, we have, we have a very collaborative relationship with them. Mm-hmm. So um, over the last two years, we actually re our leases. So when we listed in 2020, we had a number of lease breaks at fifth-year mark. We remove all the lease breaks and between now and the end of the lease in 2028, it is just a solid income flow from the from the landlord with no breaks in between. Mm. So one of the things that we then incentivize them to to help us and help them is to put in put together a sustainability upgrade. Uh, oh, you also got sustainability things, huh? Yes, okay, yes, okay. yes, of course. Everybody needs to have <laughs> it. Everyone got sustainability things. Okay, come. Correct, correct. Come, tell us your sustainability. So, so I think it's quite common, uh, I guess with any, most markets, uh, that when you sign long leases, uh, that you will provide, you know, certain rent incentives. So our rent incentives is not in the form of rent free. We what we told them is that we'll contribute fifty million of pounds for sustainability upgrades to the properties, and they themselves actually create uh, contributed a uh, amount that's even larger than our amount. So I think it's a win win. I think for them, these leases that we sign are triple net leases, which means that for example, they they have to pay for the utilities, uh, not us. So when the assets gets upgrade to a more sustainable level, usually there's some cost savings things with regards to utilities in general, uh, be it heating or lighting. Mm-hmm. So so that's a win-win for, for both of us. For me as well, because it's triple net, I can't you know, open the door, barge in on a Sunday and say, I want to change the light bulbs. Right? So I have to also get them on the journey to let us help them. And that's what we've been doing. And because of that, uh, we have at least uh, quarterly uh, catch-ups with them to understand what sustainability works that they're doing, but also in general to, to talk about the mm-hmm. tendencies that we have. Mm-hmm. Okay, so th- that sounds well and good, right? Mm. You, you have a good relationship with them. You know, you you guys establish some sort of a pathway forward. Yeah. You know, but uh, how are you gonna raise the rent, right? Mm. <laughs> because yeah, the landlord, mm. right? Uh, shareholder want to derive value from this. Mm. What is your strategy? Yeah. In that sense? Uh, a few things I would say. I think the first uh, first thing is that you know we have uh rents that are actually very under rented. So on average, we probably charge them about twelve pounds per square foot per annum. Not per month, per annum. Per annum? Per annum. Oh, that's a dollar a square foot per yeah. month. Wow, wow. Okay. 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 And uh, if they want to go to, you know, a, a much newer building or uh, another building, well, firstly, they will have to incur moving costs, relocation f- uh, costs. They will also have to, um, you know, uh, disrupt their operations. Uh, they also need to get approval from the union. Uh, the staff actually are unionized within the government sector and of course they have to pay up from perhaps 11 12 pounds per square foot to 40 50 
uh, per square foot. So we're looking at a number, pick a number between 11, 12 to 40. I think there's quite a number of uh, digits that can end, uh, end up between these two numbers. Fair, fair. And mm -hmm. also, uh, there's probably not a lot of property options. <laughs> in the, if yeah. you go to, if you travel in the UK, you know, I mean, of course, London is London. Some mm. of the big cities are as such. But mm. if you go into the townships, you know, there's that one main street and mm. then your property is probably within the vicinity of the main street. Yes. Nobody's building a new building around. That's so that's right. kind of the situation, right? That's absolutely right. So usually they are in front of train stations or <laughs> bus stations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's quite common. Uh, and that's quite complementary to some of the asset classes we're looking at. Mm. Actually, in, even in London, we have uh, about 10 assets and a number of them sits on the Elizabeth line. Uh, which is a new train line. New. Yeah, actually, I went to visit one recently, and I think Kenny one went to visit one uh, last year, right? Yeah, last yeah, year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe you can share also what what your thoughts of the actually the was. location is pretty good. That's mm. why I'm thinking of instead of just using it just for a job center, can mm. you, can you maybe just change it to some other thing? For example, hotel mm. or maybe have a gym on top to, mm. to for social for for elderly <laughs> or convert to something, yes, right? Because yes. it's the same building, right? Then. Uh, are you able to do it like the Singapore style, the community yeah, center? Like the, the it's one stop shop, one stop shop, one hub, right? Everything, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, possibly. Actually, we're looking at co-location for some of our assets. Uh, but generally, I think the in fact we have one property in Stavenage. Uh, there is a job center on the second, third floor and part of the first floor. Then the rest, I think there's a fried chicken, a pizza and a, a <laughs> spray tan. Spray tan next yeah. to a fried chicken and pizza. Yeah. <laughs> The reason why it's uh, there's a retail trade is because it's also in the center of uh, yeah, the city, yeah. yeah, I get so, it. So, so there there are uh, such uh, such uh, propositions, but I think uh, what is perhaps you know more commonly sought, I think at this point in time, is that we are also speaking with other government departments to see if a co-location, say between the job center and another government department, could work as well. But I think the other way to look at things as well is some of these assets, besides co-location as a, you know, a, a different use of the asset, uh, we could also convert them to residential or even student accommodation. Yeah. Can you convert them to the FMB? FMB, I think would same floors or the first floor FMB, second floor. I job think center. I think oh, we, if we, we we bring out the community center, <laughs> the concept, here, concept, la. concept la. Go yeah, yeah. Singapore <laughs> export I, this. Actually, yeah, you you can uh. because they would be com they will be zoned as commercial, so mm. I don't think that's a big difficulty mm -hmm. with the way it is. In fact, yeah. it's probably quite uh quite uh, possible, but we have to get the the tenant to agree to that, of course. Mm, okay. okay, that means there uh, will be a lot of upside like, if you're mm. able to really roll out your strategy. Correct. In in interesting. Let mm. me understand this a little bit, right? Yeah. So there will be some of these buildings that, that's within your REIT that it's doing fine, the tenant is there, and then mm -hmm. you try to see how you can essentially bring more tenants into this these locations. Yeah. Right. So do you need to kind of put in some capex to increase the floor space? Right. Do you need to build out because a mm. lot of these buildings are not that high? Mm. You know, there's they're smaller, two, three floors, mm. you know, that type, right? So how, how do you kind of do that? Yeah. What is the plan? So I think generally because the assets are now triple net, uh, mm. so if there's any capex, it will be will be on, on us. Yeah. Uh, but if there's any OPEX, say for occupancy, because they want to bring in another government tenant, then I think that will probably be uh, you know, for them to to pick up. Mm. If we are putting in a, a, a new tenant, quite quite unlikely, but let's say we were bringing in a retail tenant, then I think that that will be something we need to sort out uh, together with the tenant. Okay, so, so essentially, there's a possibility, let's mm. be clear, right? there's a possibility of exporting community centers. Yes, yes. <laughs> In the UK, got chance, but not within your strategy yeah. as the primary yeah. focus. Because I mean, these assets, uh, some of them are, they are varying sizes as of well. Of course. Yeah, right? yeah. So some of them, I think it would just be a lot easier if we just... Uh, and some of them are very old, convert. so I don't know the structural integrity can tahan or... Well, right. actually, yeah. the good thing is that they are built in the era where it's usually masonry. And the uh, the soil condition is probably a bit different from Singapore. Where it's a bit soft, oh. uh, so in some cases you can actually add uh, additional floors upstairs. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. In fact, if you walk uh, up and down uh, some of the streets in the UK plus London, if if you look at the top of the buildings, uh, usually the top two floors may have a different look. Yes, yes, yes. These they, are new. They add on one. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yes, you can okay. do so. Interesting. Between now until your let, uh, the lease break in 2028, do we have any chance to really up a rent? No. So there is none. Uh, but we are already in uh, early discussions uh, with the tenant uh, to renew this lease uh, ending in 2028. You bring forward the renewal? 
we are uh, no, we're actually only talking about leases, uh, extending leases beyond 2028. Oh, so we're not okay. bringing it forward. Uh, there is, there's no avenue for that, mm-hmm. right? Unless they compensate less. It is, you know, quite a fairly regular lease uh, in that in that sense. Interesting. Interesting. So we are, we I think if you look at uh, PFI uh, structures, PFI stands for Private Funding Initiatives, and this is a structure that's been there since 1992, has been around for a long time in the UK. It's not just uh, our sort of our tenants. If you look at other government agencies such as National Healthcare System (NHS), so they they lease. Uh, from the private sector, hospitals, clinics, dentist offices. Um, if you look at the HRMC, His Majesty Revenue and Collection, which will be our IRAS equivalent, they also lease properties and and the uh, Ministry of Defense. Uh, so many government agencies actually operate PFI structures, uh, you know, in in the in the UK market, and that gives us quite a fair bit of comparables to to benchmark ourselves against when we look at these leases. And the other thing to note is that these leases tend to be rather long term in nature, 10, 15 years, twenty five years even. Uh, we see some of these, but typically the longer you go, there will be certain lease breaks. Uh, in 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 between the, the mm. start and the and the end. So essentially from now to 2028, you're pretty much running stable on a stable cash, correct. cash flow. We're not see, we're not gonna see a lot of new interesting things, right? Yeah. But you do have a float because there's a advanced payment on correct. both and that front. Correct. And so what do you plan to do in terms of kind of upgrading that value further mm. down, right? Because not all will perform the same, right? Mm. And you have some sort of a strategy to, to yes. derive more yield. How does so that work? I think one way is really the conversion of the potential conversions of some of these assets. Um, so we're, we're, I think very quickly within the next 12 months, we expect that we will know from our discussions with the DWP to understand which assets they will likely leave. And then we can plan our alternatives for some of these assets. And that's where the upside could be. The other one that's quite interesting, I think I mentioned maybe in passing, maybe to you, Kenny, is that uh, we actually have an asset in the northwest of England that is a large asset. One third of it is occupied by two buildings that's, that's leased to the Department of uh, Work and Pension, for Work and Pension. And the other two third is actually just grassland. It is potentially a good site for a data center. Uh, as to whether we'll go down that path, we don't know yet. Yeah. But we will convert it and then I we'll see. I hear data center a bit scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. so maybe I'll explain yeah, uh, yeah. Why, why it's quite interesting. There mm-hmm. is actually a new uh, data cable comes from the United States through Ireland. And uh, it drops off at the at, at the beach, which is less than three kilometers from this asset. It's in Blackpool uh, mm. in Northwest. And then it connects uh, through uh, the terrestrial and then all the way to the Nordics. The other thing that's quite interesting, other than this data uh, cable, which is, I think, a very, very big uh, use case because it's new. We're talking about a low latency product, potentially. Mm. The other uh, the other thing that's also quite interesting is that around the the, the waters of, of Blackpool, there is actually a big offshore wind farm being built by BP and uh, a German uh, partner. They expected to come online in 2028, 2029, thereabouts, uh, providing a source of uh, potential renewable energy for, for data centers. Mm. You know, that's a hot topic now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sustainability with data centers don't quite go hand in hand. Fair, fair, fair. But from a CapEx standpoint, isn't it quite mm. crazy? It would be. Build up, because now, now what you're running, you have those old red brick houses. Yes. You're lease optimizing over the course of the next few years. You know, mm. when the lease matures, you will try to do some optimization. Mm. And then we were talking about like doing some sort of student comms. So those things are low capex, right? Mm. Once you enter this data center game, uh, yeah. it's a different story. No, you know? yeah, so where's it, your prioritization? So you're absolutely right. So if you look at how, you know, I will give an analogy, how you sort of, uh, you know, develop this asset. The first thing we could actually do is to change of use. And once you have the planning, it's a, it's a very good and very powerful option that enhances the, uh, the viability or, you know, the marketability of the of the land. After that, what you do with it is really up to you. You could, at a point in time, you could sell this land or you could actually take it forward. If you take it forward, that's where the big money will come in, into mm-hmm. play. And if you want to take it forward, what are some ways or strategies you can do with it? So mm-hmm. one of the things that even for the, um, the PBSA or the BTR, the built to rent residential that we talk about, our, our thinking is that, you know, we probably, won't be raising a lot of uh, capital for it. We're happy to take a minority stake subject to you know all your requirements that the MAS uh, requires for JV uh, JV uh, agreements, you know, the ability to extract dividends when it's completed and so on and so mm. forth. We're happy to to have minority stake to stay invested in the upside. Then we're happy to bring in other parties capital, be it a JV partner with operating capability or even sponsors money. 
mm-hmm. right? So we have uh, two, str- uh, two, the three. We have three uh, strong sponsors. You know that that uh, financially they're very strong. They are willing to also co-invest in some of these assets as well. Okay, so Sunway wants to build data center. I, I don't <laughs> know whether I mean the. <laughs> It might be a bit too early to say, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but you know what we will probably do at this point in time is to get the, you know, we've got the power as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot to mention that it's quite important. We've got 60 mega uh, MVA of uh, power that's been reserved with the local authorities mm-hmm. uh, and with a pathway to get renewable energy as well. Interesting, interesting. Mm. But do you think that your team, your maybe your current team not don't have any expertise in well, this? Well, it will be the thing. same for PBS in BTR. Uh, mm-hmm. We will have to work with our operating partners. Partner. Okay. Okay. If the yeah. asset, if the location, uh, and the attributes all uh, checks out, then uh, I think the capital wouldn't be really the issue. It's about the brain power, mm. right? Not the financial muscle. Interesting. Yeah. So I would actually always be seeking for, uh, let's say, for the data center or operator, mm. uh, maybe a hyperscaler or end user that will sign up for a long term contract. Yeah. Someone like maybe Google, Microsoft, uh, yeah, yeah. TikTok. Oh, no. Yeah, Singtel, something. Singtel. Yeah. <laughs> Singtel built its data center raised on KKR, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Very high PE. Yes. So that is a strategy. I think a lot of people are exploring something similar, yeah. which is essentially what you point out, right? You yeah. don't just raise on open market right. because maybe the uh, si- situation is not so favorable. Yeah. Try to look for some uh, patient capital to join in on your on your right. Correct, correct. Okay. And, and, uh, and the other thing has, that has really, really changed in the last 18 months is AI. We I've just came back from a, a data a, a, con, a data center conference in, in France, and uh, the lot of the buzzword is that they can't build quick enough. And the if if you are able to offer to a hyperscaler a site a big site like ours with secure power, with visibility of planning, and to have the ability to tap re- renewable energy, I think it's a very very big sell. Uh, of course, for us, it was quite opportunistic that the data ca- cable landing point is just less than five kilometers. Yeah, yeah. From Which is asset. important. I mean, for our listeners, if you don't understand, right, the mm. uh, internet is still connected by wires. Huh? So the shorter the wire is, the faster it is. Huh? So Correct. latency is lower. Okay, so, so it's just, <laughs> just a simple layman discussion. Correct. Right? Even like for, you know, if you were entering the chat GPT, mm-hmm. if, if, uh, if, if you got to wait more than three seconds for a response, yeah, yeah, you won't yeah. be quite happy, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. But uh, be a bit patient. So the, the <laughs> Power is very intense on that front. Yeah. Okay, okay. Fair, fair. So I see what you're saying, right? Mm. There are some possibilities here and there. Mm. You know, uh, whatever that works, continue to work. You pick take the rent, whatever that's not, you try to manage your capex investment, mm. but try to, you know, engineer some upside over there, right? Correct. But there are a lot of different stories. Huh? So mm. I just want to be clear to our audience, right? What are your priorities? Yep. Like mm. what are your main stories, <clears throat> right? But potential is potential. Let's get down to what's going to happen okay. in the next few years. I think say. when uh, we speak to many investors, particularly the institutional investors, they want to understand what's uh, what's your your upshot in the next 12 months, right? Mm. They yeah. Usually people don't have a lot of uh, patience. Mm. 12 months is uh, the horizon they look at. It's quite sad, huh? <laughs> That's, which is why sometimes, you know, the non-institutional investors, you know, at the end of the day, if the uh, horizon is between more than 12 uh, months, they can actually benefit a lot sometimes, mm. right? Mm-hmm. That's that, if that's the case. But anyway, for the next 12 months, what we have been doing, I think up till middle of this year, will be really housekeeping. We, we've done a little bit of that already. Uh, number one, I think uh, start of the year, we had a very successful fundraising on the equity side. Uh, of course, the story was, uh, was not to acquire, but to uh, bring down the level of uh, caring. And we saw that as being very helpful to help us uh, negotiate uh, with the banks on our refinancing. So that was a nice segue to the next uh, initiative that we have uh, since they're undertaken. Uh, for our largest um, uh, group of debt, uh, we have uh, found uh, two lenders to replace one. Uh, the two might become three in, in two course. And then we've got another um, financing that's uh, coming up. Uh, and we're looking for solutions for that as well. And again, Having the fundraising and having Sunway back the fundraising uh, was very, very helpful, mm. you know, to basically use that uh, strategic advantage to help us with the refinancing. I think we should be done uh, in the next few months. Once we are done, it's really looking at how do we sort of um, change the or bring up the NAV of the assets. Mm. Sure, I'm not going to be waiting around for the Bank of England to cut rates. <laughs> I can't control that. Right? It's coming soon, coming yeah, soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, I, that's not in my business business plans because I can't control it, right, as management team. But what we can control is things like the data center. 
So the data center, I think just by the change of use in the land, will help us bring down our gearing to hopefully below 40%. So that's what we're targeting. Mm. And that's a very big initiative. We're spending time, uh, effort on it because that will give us, uh, you know, what we need. So then you see uh, that as your big win? As that's going to be something that we, it's written into our KPIs mm. as a team. So you means that once you change of the use itself, immediately your uh, the valuation you go up so yeah. that your gearing come up. Yeah. Okay. So that's something we're looking for. For to then the other thing is also uh, sorting out the vacant assets. We've got, I think start of year we've got seven vacant assets. Uh, we'll soon be able to collect uh, all the labs and and just round and just uh, put that pursuit behind us and move forward. So with the remaining assets, uh, vacant ones, uh, one of them or two of them, we will probably uh, change them into student accommodation because the existing university towns well located, close to universities. And the other couple, you know, we might we might sort of change them into built to rent residential, and another, uh, another three or four will probably sell. So this uh, change of use actually uh, helps us kill two birds with one stone, right? Once it uh, it sort of uh, brings in revenue into the assets again. Mm. And secondly, of course, it also brings up the valuation of the properties, which also reduce gearing. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting. But it's medical clinic or hospital or working with NHS is one of our ad- agenda? Yes. So we are definitely open to that. We really have a conversation with them. Um, you know, and, and we were hoping to bring that forward in the next few months. Lah. You'll be also in the next 12 months. Some of these things, fingers crossed, uh, it's not just me willing and able, the other party also needs to be willing and able. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's put it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty exciting because yeah, yeah. those those things that really can revalue your property to yeah. the higher valuation. Yeah, correct. So actually the, the other thing is also... Uh, and this is something I expect that we will we will have a lending in the next twelve months. Is having clarity on the post twenty twenty eight on the assets. Uh, whilst we have been telling everybody, you know, that these are you know, community centers, uh, they are very resilient, and uh, mm. DWP will have to be in most of them, if not all. But we still, at the end of the day, still need to show, you know, in black and white the the lease extensions. Mm. And once that is done, uh, the valuation will also will firm up. Your right. relationship with the government, UK government, is uh, your biggest strength. Correct. You, know, right. you can do a lot of things. That's right. And I think uh, then the next question probably have your mind is the government uh, change coming up. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, how would you, the, the change on the election, uh, yeah. or, or, or the agenda, or the win, tax huh? burden mm. and those things, or the tax, tax question, uh, mm. how would it affect your uh, elite you carry? Yeah, mm-hmm. fortunately, I think we, like I mentioned uh, very early on, that we are actually like a UK read. Uh, so we do really enjoy a, a better level of tax than other non-UK reads. For example, there are other, say, Singapore landlords with, with properties in the UK, they, they don't enjoy the same level of tax as us. Mm. Uh, Can you we, give us some colour? What does that mean? So, for example, there is a withholding tax. We pay probably on, on average, uh, the headline tax is 15%. You will have some tax shield, so effective is about 11 and 12. Without that, I think you pay about uh, 20 or 20% or more. So, there is a really uh, a benefit. But I think the coming back to the Labour Party, which is, I think, Right now, as we speak, I think Labour will win. Uh, yeah. These numbers look like Labour's going to win. Yes. Correct, correct. So I, it looks like it. Everybody's saying that. Yeah. And that's also not a bad thing for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, the social welfare was invested. It's Labour created this thing. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at uh, the past 100 years, 120, 110 years uh, mm. ago, I think the Labour Party invented social welfare. Mm-hmm. Right. So for them, they always have a very pro workers, pro Labour, mm. pro uh, training uh, agenda. You know that is very uh you know a uh, broad base, and that really fits in very well with uh, that the uh, agenda of the Department of Work and for Work mm. and Pensions. That that's also very helpful. The the other thing is also, I think in the UK has been severely underbuilt in terms of residential and uh, affordability for housing is is mm. a concern. So there there's this uh, agenda in the UK for quite some time, which will con- continue under the uh, Labour government is the agenda of leveling up. Where I think a lot of activity, economic, uh, uh, you know, benefits actually been centered around London. Uh, that's I think in the last uh, few years, you know, at last decade even, I think there's a bit of a push to try to even up this growth uh, to the rest of UK, moving uh, northwards and and to the rest of the UK. Mm-hmm. And our assets being quite dispersed, being you know very well located uh, within uh, the the cities and towns that they are. 
actually plays a very, very uh, meaningful role in not just leveling up, but also the building for residential agenda. One actually, I mean, one interesting development I think I'd like to share is that there's been a very recent but subtle but important change of to the uh, development, I guess, regime in the UK. So there's something called permitted development rights in the UK. But this has been around since 2016. Along the way, I think they put in a cap on the automatic conversion from office to residential. Now, in March this year, the cap has been removed. So basically, automatically, if you're converting from office to residential, you are already given in principle approval. Mm. So in, in unlike Singapore, you know, Singapore, they plan five years, 20 years in advance. The URA is very good for mm. that, right? In the UK, if you are going down the planning route, it can actually take up to two years because during that two years, they'll be assessing things such as environmental policy, whether your roads are large enough to accommodate them, you know, the, the more residential, more traffic in, in the area, police coverage, fire coverage, school coverage, things like that. So it, that's why it takes time, right? Because you haven't pre-planned it. But for PDR, permitted development rights, uh, it's almost like an automatic conversion mm. uh, because it's underbuilt in terms of residential. So they desperately need housing. Mm. And many councils actually would have uh, minimum quotas to deliver housing. And many of them are not meeting those quotas. Mm. So actually... A bit of a government friend in that sense. Uh, mm. We're meeting those agendas, leveling up as well as residential conversion. Mm. But you have so many exciting opportunities, right? Mm. <laughs> do we have enough cash to do all these things? Mm. Mm. <laughs> like What's the percentage? Yeah. 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 So that's that's why I think mean, earlier on, as I said, the we are looking at working with uh, operating partner, partners, yeah. those that can bring not just financial mus muscle. We also need them to put in some money to for alignment. So wait, just, just to be very mm. clear, right? You have no ambition of becoming an owner-operator. Right, so you just want to own it, and then you bring a strategic partner in, and then they put out the capex, and then they yeah. run it, something yeah. like that. That's Correct. the plan, and and that's very helpful as well because in the sense that if you think about the UK, such models actually uh really exist for a very long time. Many of the PBSA operators they don't operate uh them it themselves. They would have uh specialized say PBSA uh, operators, you know that has that's, that's done this. They have econ economies of skill. They manage their... Uh, I'm not going to be running the concierge. And just the one yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. Enough problems with really. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, I think that market's spoken for. The same for, for uh, built to rent residential. Mm. Uh, I don't want to be managing the guy that's, you know, managing the gym or the security guard <laughs> or the deliveries. So we let uh, those partners uh, run those. Okay. And if not, they are always the party providers. Mm. Likewise with the data center. I think the you know, in the, they say in Hokkien as well, right? Uh, it's good to be smart, but don't act smart. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, act smart. <laughs> so... So it's like one of those things where, you know, you do what you can. Then mm. if, uh, if you, if, when it gets to a certain level of complexity where you know you're not well equipped to do it, very, we'd be very happy to work with partners. And the other thing is also the MNS limits us with regards to development uh, activities, 10%, right? Uh, yeah. So we also, you know, inbuilt with us within our SJX listing, we do need to have that kind of financial discipline. Mm. as well so mm. you know not to be overly greedy you know to take risk with with a uh, with a uh, uh you know with a good level of dosage so in short basically your focus will be more your portfolio optimization yes all right because it's enough work for you to do already are you planning to really look for any acquisition i think firstly the share price needs to improve <laughs> Cost of debt also needs to come down. It's not very hard to. Give but the DPO is start turning, turning yeah. up. Uh. Yeah. So that and hopefully after this, uh, yeah. this uh, podcast, yeah, 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 my yeah. shippers will jump out. Yeah, then yeah. maybe we'll do something. Yeah. But, but but jokes aside, I, I think you can fly us into the UK. Can <laughs> <laughs> free ticket for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the, the share price needs to correct to, you know, do better uh, mm -hmm. in order for the deal to be creative. I mean, the whole point of having basically elaborating what our strategy is, is also to tell the market that, you know, this is our focus. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not about to go, uh, you know, quite quite crazy in doing everything, logistics, like retail, like hotels, you know, so we, we are quite focused. It's, it's really our current portfolio of social infrastructure mm -hmm. plus the living sector which mm. is PBSA, BTR. Do you have a very strong operation team to really help you to realize your, your team? Because at the mm. end of the day, it's an execution. Correct, correct. Mm. So we do. Uh, we actually have a local team uh, in the UK. And uh, between myself and the uh, CFO and my IR, uh, we actually do travel up to, to UK quite frequently. Mm. I, I get it, right? Like, uh, 
Yeah, your story is it's there. You own a lot of things, yeah. you know, and then you want to see how to kind of engineer it up, you know, over the course of a um, few years, and then mm. from there you manage your capex al- alongside it, right? Correct, correct. So, so I understand that. Yeah, but maybe you can kind of paint for our listeners, right? Yeah, what is the upside potential in mm. in in this view, right? Especially in this market today, right? What what are we looking at? If you put in all this work to kind mm. of engineer that 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 ref generation what, what are we looking at yeah i think um i i can't give a forward forecast oh. right or not on the sgx yeah. but the what we're trying to gun for is a lower leverage that gives us quite a fair bit of financial flexibility okay. i think the dpu and the share price is really at a almost rock bottom right mm. we are trading at a fairly big discount 40 percent to nav as well so, so 0.6 mm, price to book. Okay. Correct, correct. 0.6 price to book. So we want to push that up. And of course, one way is to uh, talk it up, which mm. is what we're trying to do now. But the other way is simply just move out NAV. Mm. And how do I move out NAV? Is all these uh, little things that we're doing on the asset, extending the lease and all that. So that should help. Once NAV goes up and the you know the share price, even if the discount uh still is maintained the share price will go up as well mm. so it's we're trying to get ourselves into this virtuous cycle mm. right now but your enemy probably will be turning because mm. there are two uh two catalysts mm. one is uh by changing of your use yes. that will really help you boost your NAV. on the other hand is because the interest rate is is picking mm. right then uh, moving forward there'll be a start to cut in interest rate will that help in your portfolio valuation Def- definitely definitely uh mm. although i think if you ask the value they will be quite careful about saying anything about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right they, of course uh, they yeah, have their own business interest right correct, yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, but yeah. uh it will help but to me it's a it's a good bonus to have but yeah. at the end of the day if i haven't done anything i can't go to the board and say uh hey can pay my team a big bonus because mm. we're just mm. waiting for bank of yeah. england to cut mm, mm. it's not a business I, strategy I young child with bank of england yeah, exactly <laughs> If, yeah. if, if that's a strategy, I motivate them. Yeah, if, if that's a strategy, I just go to church and temple, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's still there's still another element, which is the British pound and also sing dollar conversion rate, mm. right? Mm. Because at the end of the day, I think majority of investors they are still a Singapore investor. Mm. So what what do you foresee the the pound moving forward? I mean, because we are we listed in pounds and all cash flows are naturally hedged, we generally don't really hedge against the the sing dollars, mm. so to speak. But it is uh you know a valid concern for retail investors uh, for those with you know sing dollar uh, requirements more than GBP. So there is actually a bit of sort of uh, imagination that you need to have on the UK economy and the pounds in general. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean the the fact is that. Uh, if you've got real estate, if you've got uh, education requirements in GBP, uh, that's always a good, you know, good currency exposure to have. Mm-hmm. That's uh, what I was thinking. Like, yeah. the who who will who in Singapore will need GBP, right? Oh, mm-hmm. you send your kids to the you UK, it's funny, yeah. yeah. right? So <laughs> very you, expensive. You <laughs> invest in elite, elite uh, UK rate, <laughs> then generate a dividend <laughs> to pay for your school fees. Your, <laughs> your kid, they use in Great Britain pound. Okay. No, and that that yeah. is actually some what some of our investors have done. Really, uh, people yes. do that. Yes, just because they send their kid over. They, <laughs> They okay. do, they do. And, so you're uh, building families, huh? Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> some of them, for example, they have investment in uh, UK guilds, right? So mm-hmm. they just call uh, their banks, mm-hmm. uh, bankers to sort of convert them because to, they, they view this as some somewhat of a quasi-exposure to the UK government as well, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So they've, they've also done that. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. actually for a listener out there, mm-hmm. actually they should should think about this strategy mm-hmm. right? interesting it ties yeah. to your if you send your kid to the uk <laughs> actually the the the, the with regards to the exchange rate as well it's it's not really that the gbp is is weak it's also the sing dollar has been strong against all currencies jet yen mm-hmm. us dollar yeah. mm-hmm. you know yeah. so uh it is also um i guess hedging the sing dollar in that sense mm-hmm. by having exposure to other currencies mm-hmm. yeah i think that may be one of the reason why singapore investor they are holding back mm-hmm. do we have any plan to really have a dual class currency mm. so uh we have considered that in the past before even i joined this this uh, read right and that's something that we we'll continue to explore now the the thing is that uh you know when when i uh have one bubble ship bu- bubble tea uh shop right if i open another shop would all my customers go to the other shop and then my one my my original bubble tea shop is empty mm-hmm. so that's that's always a consideration so far just looking at some of my uh, peers uh, that has dual currency mm-hmm. That tends to be okay. The impact. Okay, you have one kosong and yeah, yeah. And you, 
Okay, yeah. okay. And you don't want to absorb the risk, you know. In terms no, I mean, of if, if if you have more customers at the two bubble tea shops, mm-hmm. then that's great. Okay. If okay. you have still most trading in one currency and the other okay. one is yeah. not much. Actually, activity. the liquidity is not yeah. there yet. And cost-wise, is, I, I understand it's not not that much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just the effort. Why do it, right? Okay. Mm. But besides promoting your read to the Singapore investor, mm. do you have any plan to really promote to uh, maybe for the investor in UK? Because since there are no... But there are actually UK investors uh, into the read uh, as well. Um, we also do actually have a lot of Malaysian I'm uh, sure. and Thai investors. Malaysian send a lot of their case to the UK. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And Correct. your backer is Sunway, right? Correct. So Absolutely there's right. there's a lot of natural affinity we, there. We do actually meet up quite a fair bit of uh, investors in KL when mm. we visit them. Partly, I think the the, the traction that we have uh, in the market is mm. also, I think as you said, they send the kids I there. Know, I know. I they themselves are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. you can, next time you want to come to KL, <laughs> we can. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> and yeah. and they, they also have properties there. Many of them have have mm. uh, properties in, in London, UK. You know, I think Battersea, for example, had many uh, Malaysian investors, right? So we do have many uh, Southeast Asian investors that's uh, on our register. Do you have a lot of uh, big institutions holding your current mm. REIT or family offices? Yeah, many family offices. And uh, our largest unit holder is uh, Partners REIT. It's a reinsurance company that's based out of the US. Mm-hmm. So they are largest uh, stakeholder in terms of equity. And last year or this year, uh, when we did the fundraising, I actually started preparing for that in September last year. We went to see them both in Paris as well as Connecticut in, in the US to get the buy-in to support us on the fundraising. So without which, and the sponsor, of course, also step up to, to mop up the rest. The, and that was actually the cornerstone how the, the deal was uh, successful. Mm-hmm. Some people told me, hey, Josh, you're very smart. You thought the valuation come down, you you did the fundraising. I'm like, actually, that didn't happen in December. That started in September. There's a lot of work that mm-hmm. goes behind. I'm sure. Scene. These yeah. kind of deals yeah. take a long time. Yeah, yeah because okay. you have a very strong uh, cash flow uh, from your portfolio itself. Do mm-hmm. you have a lot of pension fund really investing, so, expecting all the... Yeah, cash- so um, pension funds, um, I think not so much. But then many of the uh, family offices that invest, they do have the sort of same uh, sort of uh, mentality or mindset partners we for example um, they they actually for them uh, many of their investments are in fixed income mm. so they view us as a quasi government fixed income play mm. as well mm. so essentially because you front load the capital like mm. front load the rental you take three months <laughs> advance mm. so you expect your dpu to hold stable yes, yes. okay yeah. okay interesting interesting fingers nice. crossed uh, rates comes down that's even better right yeah 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 okay yeah. interesting cool okay so i i think uh, you, you share a lot Good, good insights, mm. right? So uh, if our audience, you know, I give you two minutes, uh, you, you sell to them, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any last things yeah. you want to say to them, you know, like, you know, why you should invest in me, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think many of our unit holders actually have supported us uh, since IPO and they came in at the IPO price of 68 pence. I know where we have uh, traded. You know, it's, it's a very difficult pill to swallow, but I'm a new management team and we, together as, uh, you know, as, as a whole, we are, we are also a, a big, um, I guess, victim of the of the market, but we're also trying our best with regards to you know making the asset uh, stronger, uh, extending our leases, and doing sort of uh, housekeeping uh, with the with the capital structure right now, and hopefully all this will help us to restore back to a better place, and uh, we we hope to count on. Your uh, continued support. <laughs> okay, okay, awesome, awesome. So if they want to connect with you guys, yeah, uh, how how can they? Oh, well, you're on LinkedIn, okay. and uh, we also on uh, the internet, and of course, who uh, is not on the internet, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Which website? Your, your URL. URL. Yeah, yeah. yeah, your URL is uh triple w dot elite uk read uh, dot com. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, thank, thank you for you. your time. All the best. Thank you. Nice. All right, thank you.